So, uh, so tonight we're here to recognize and commemorate an important event in American history. This is the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, the destruction of the tea that sent a message loud and clear to Parliament and to the merchant princes of England and to King George III himself that many American colonists would no longer stand for onerous taxes unless they had some say in the matter. Um, and to tell you all about it, and to explain why we are meeting in New Bedford, miles away from the wharves of Boston, uh, to commemorate this event, is my pleasure to welcome Evan O'Brien, uh, creative manager of the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum for tonight's event. Evan and I uh, just met last Tuesday. We had a spirited local history guild. Anybody, any local history guilders here? All right, super. Um, conversation all about the Tea Party, the Tea Party Ships and Museum, the East India Company, and many features of the story uh, that are important uh, for us as Americans to remember. Um, the Dartmouth was a Tea Party ship uh, built in Bedford Village, first ship actually built here. Um, it was a cargo vessel um, built to carry whale oil uh, to England and all kinds of onerous taxable stuff back from England to the colonies. Um, and uh, so that's, what, that's, why we're, that's why we're all here tonight. Uh, in meeting in New Bedford is that uh, we actually had a part in the in the story. So um, uh, we'll join Evan's discussion in New Bedford's connection to the Boston Tea Party, a special reenactment and theatrical performance featuring historical interpreters from the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. Actually, I don't think they are historical interpreters. I think they're actually the real thing. Um, you know, they, 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 yeah, they sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a Doctor Who-like sort of moment, you know, where you're actually back in time, and, they, and, and, and they've come to, to uh, elucidate uh, all of this live, in person. And uh, you all will participate in a dramatic meeting of the body of the people and experience a recreation of the, dest of the destruction of the tea on board uh, our, uh, the largest ship model in the world, uh, uh, the whaler, uh, the whaling bark Lagoda in the museum gallery. So, and then there will be a reception with food and uh, apparently tea-infused cocktails. So this is good stuff. Um, let's give a warm round of applause to Evan O'Brien. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Mike just said, my name is Evan O'Brien. I'm the creative manager at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. And we are here today in the commemorative 250th year, anniversary year of the Boston Tea Party, to commemorate New Bedford's connection to this iconic moment in American history. And so it's my privilege to be here with all of you today to talk about this important chapter of American history. Obviously, I want to thank the team here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, uh, Beatrice and Carissa, for all of your support and your help making both the History Guild evening possible and tonight's presentation possible. So thank you so very much. Um, we're here today to talk not just about New Bedford, not just about the Boston Tea Party, but the significance of 250 years and what that means for the history of the Boston Tea Party, what that means to New Bedford, what that means to our nation's history and its greater connection to the world in which we live. Now, really quickly, I want to tell you a little bit about our museum. Um, my role at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum, the creative manager, is to lead a team of dedicated men and women who work together to tell the story of what we believe to be the single most important event leading up to the American Revolution, the Boston Tea Party. And as the head of museums programming and the creative team, my job is to make sure that our museum experience is working great, our wonderful historical interpreters are supplied with the knowledge that they need to be successful, and that our guests find our experience to be accessible, educational, engaging, and of course the most important word of all, fun. And we can combine history and fun together, and we're going to show you how we're going to do that tonight. We, of course, teach the story of the Boston Tea Party as an organization by combining three uh, different techniques. Of course, we combine first person historical interpretation and live theatrical performance with high tech interactive exhibits and technology and colonial era artifacts to fully illustrate the time period of the Boston Tea Party and bring to life the events of December 16th, 1773 for a 21st century audience from around the world. And we do have an international audience at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. Over one million people have come since we've opened our doors in 2012 and we work really hard to make this 
what is often considered to be in a very American story, accessible to everyone that enters our, through our doors. Now we do this with a combination of in-person guided experiences led by our amazing historical interpreters, but also through an educational program, a virtual outreach that allows us to bring the story of the Boston Tea Party into classrooms using um, all of the virtual streaming technologies and we can bring the story of the Boston Tea Party into any classroom anywhere in the world. These three techniques, these three elements, provide us as educators different ways to help students and adults alike learn what can be considered a very convoluted and comprehensive chapter of American history. It provides us as educators a great platform to encourage educational spontaneity, to encourage play in museum learning, and we also find that this three-tiered uh, methodology helps people to retain this information so much more easily because they're having fun while they're learning it. Our focus, of course, over the last, well, it seems like more like a half a decade now, uh, has been on the approaching anniversary, the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, of course, which is right around the corner, coming up on December 16th, 2023. To commemorate this historic anniversary, there are many different organizations that are all working hand in hand. Our organization may be the one at the forefront, but we are just one of a myriad of organizations all working together to commemorate this important chapter in American history. And we are all working hand in hand for a commemorative year that will culminate on the 250th anniversary, December 16th. This year is well underway uh, with a whole series of special uh, speaking events like tonight, um, grave marker ceremonies as we're going all around uh, the United States placing commemorative markers at the graves of known Boston Tea Party participants, special theatrical performances, again like what we'll be doing this evening, and partnerships with various historical organizations and of course the arts, tourism, and hospitality industries. Everyone across the Commonwealth is coming together to really commemorate this important chapter of our history. And this commemorative year will, of course, be culminating in the grand scale reenactment of the Boston Tea Party, which we'll be talking about in just a few minutes. Now, there is, of course, significant interest in this anniversary. It's, you know, the biggest thing uh, since the bicentennial. And we are looking at this event as the big kickoff to all the upcoming 250th anniversaries right around the corner that our nation is about to commemorate. And so there's a lot of pressure to get it right and to make these, this programming and all these activities as, as accessible to as many people as we possibly can because there is significant interest in schools and museums and the general public. Why is there so much interest in the Boston Tea Party? Well, I have a whole host of, of reasons that I think that people instantaneously connect with the Boston Tea Party. It is an event that is instantaneously recognizable. If you hear the words Boston Tea Party, what pops into your mind? Well, images like these. A bunch of people storming aboard various vessels, dramatically uh, dressed up in what is often said to be a costume of a mohawk, and don't worry, I will touch on that in just a few minutes. Storming aboard these vessels, breaking chests of tea open, hurling the loose leaf tea over the side and the chests into Boston Harbor for good measure. You see often triumphant poses in this artwork. People screaming at the top of their lungs, raising their tricorner hats, their cocked hats in the air triumphantly. You see people on the wharves yelling and getting involved in this great hullabaloo. Well, these are instantaneously recognizable pieces of art. They mean something to people. We learn this event in elementary school. We learn about this event in elementary school. And so when we hear the Boston Tea Party, when we think about these important commemorative uh, episodes in our future, we hearken back to something that is tangible for us. It's emotional to us. We think about our childhood and we think about sitting in history class. Many of you probably loved being in history class. Some of you maybe didn't love being in history class, but you've developed that love of history over your life and you're here today. So there is something personal about the Boston Tea Party that I think really resonates with people. Maybe it's the artwork, but the artwork can also be very complex, very complicated, and very inaccurate. And so we'll be talking a little bit about 
this inaccuracy and why the Boston Tea Party has, in some respects, been sensationalized over the years and why it's important in this year of all years to really set the record straight as to the truth of the destruction of the tea that took place on December 16th, 1773. So it's so important to remember that what we often think we know about the Boston Tea Party, most of it is pretty darn close, but some of it might miss the mark just a bit. And as with anything in history, the truth of the matter is far more nuanced, far more complex than we might have remembered. Ultimately, I can summarize it this way. The Boston Tea Party is one of the most famous events in American history. The Boston Tea Party is one of the most famous events in world history. It's an iconic chapter of our collective history, but it's also often one of the most misunderstood and misrepresented chapters of American history. And so we're gonna clear some of this up for you today. Um, I always love showing this one too. Again, talk about emotional. Uh, my childhood is flashing before my eyes. I did not have this set, but I'm sure if I had known it was out there when I was a kid, I would have. And so this is what students think of. This is what we all think of when we think Boston Tea Party. And so I ask you, do you know that the Boston Tea Party was not even called the Boston Tea Party? It wasn't called the Boston Tea Party until 1826. Did you know that the tea tax did not make the tea more expensive? It actually made the tea cheaper. Did you know that the number of tea chests destroyed was not 342, as you will see in every single textbook issued across this nation? It was actually 340. Do you know that the vessels involved were not British? Technically, they were British because they belonged to the British colony, but they were captained, crewed, and built by American colonists. The tea was in loose leaf form, not brick form. There was no brick tea involved in the Boston Tea Party. And the disguises worn by some of the participants, and accent on some there, looked absolutely nothing like what you'll find in most imagery associated with the destruction of the tea. In fact, a large portion of the Boston Tea Party participants wore no disguises whatsoever. These are just a few of the myths that often come along with our understanding of this event. And part of our collective effort as an organization and for our partners is to dispel some of these myths and tackle head on the complexity that comes along with it. So if you'll permit me for just a few minutes, let's go back roughly 250 years for a brief lesson in the Boston Tea Party. Of course, that event took place on December 16, 1773, but the seeds of the tea's destruction were sown years before. For years, the American colonists had been taxed by Parliament without their consent. This taxation without representation would lead to a cyclical pattern of a tax or act being passed, the citizens of Boston protesting and rioting, in order to quell that protest, Parliament repealing the acts and then passing another act in its place. The first uh, act that was a direct tax levied upon the colonies was the Stamp Act, of course, 1765, which required a stamp be placed on paper goods such as newspapers, legal documents, bills of sale, diplomas, etc. And the passage of this act would lead to riots and protests across good old Boston town. To quell Boston's rage about this new act, Parliament would repeal the Stamp Act, but at about the same time, of course, passed the Declaratory Act, which reasserted Parliament's political dominance in the American colonies. Then, of course, came the Townsend Acts of 1767, which placed a tax on glass, lead, paint, again paper, and, of course, tea. These Townsend Acts also established a board of customs commissioners in Boston and a stringent arbitrary construct of paid colonial informants and spies and customs officers who administered search warrants and writs of assistance. The revenue collected by these acts went toward paying the salaries of royally appointed governors, judges, officials, and other military expenses. The response to all these acts was, unsurprisingly, more protests across Boston. And in response to these protests, which were increasing, England sent in the troops. In late 1768, 2,000 British soldiers 
were then stationed among the populace in Boston. This turned an already tense situation into a literal powder keg. Because of course, not a long time after that, on March 5th, 1770, the Boston Massacre would occur, and five Bostonians would lay dead in the streets. Now, as fate would have it, on the very same day as the Boston Massacre, Parliament would repeal the Townsend Acts. But of course, they would keep the tax on tea. Now, this tea tax was very important to the United East India Company, because the United East India Company was very important to the fortunes of England. England was in a bit of a bad way, but not quite as bad as the poor East India Company. In 1773, East India Company shares would plunge on the London Stock Exchange. Nearly 17 million pounds of surplus tea would sit in London warehouses. Parliament's decision was to use this tea as a means to shore up the faltering East India Company. This was a company too big to fail. And the East India Company was one of the largest and the first, think of it, a global conglomerate, a global empire, a global company and England needed it to be successful. This gave the company complete control of the tea trade in the American colonies, and England handed the East India Company a monopoly on the sale of tea in America. This tea act would make the East India tea more affordable than the smuggled tea, helping the East India Company pay off its debts. The act also allowed the East India Company to ship tea directly to America rather than selling it publicly at the London tea auctions, and it meant that the tea would be sent to trusted agents known as consignees in America who would pay the tea tax upon the importation and then offer the tea for wholesale to the American markets. Now, Bostonians were particularly concerned that if Parliament could work this system in such a way to benefit the East India Company, essentially handing them a monopoly, what would they do to other businesses? Bostonians were also irate that these consignees were handpicked by Parliament, and two of them were Royal Gover Governor Hutchinson's own sons. Talk about nepotism. Well, this tension would, of course, reach a boiling point, tea pun intended, uh, when three ships bearing the East India Company tea would arrive in Boston Harbor. Four ships were sent, but only three made it the vessel William would run aground off of Cape Cod. And that's an entirely different story for another evening, but I'll be happy to come back and tell you that one too. Now, three vessels, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver. Three vessels so inexplicably tied to the formative years of our nation. All of these vessels carrying East India Company tea. And with the Dartmouth's arrival on November 28th, there was a whole series of town meetings that began, meetings of the body of the people, and the tensions would begin to rise. These town meetings would take place at Faneuil Hall and the Old South Meeting House, lasting almost 19 days, and they were filled with passion and emotion over what to do with this cursed East India Company tea. Now, of course, the first vessel is very important to the history of New Bedford, and that would be the Dartmouth. Built in 1767, as Mike said, in Bedford Village, which is, of course, now New Bedford, Massachusetts, it was built as a cargo-carrying workhorse for the whaling industry. She was the first vessel to be constructed in the community and was captained by James Hall and carried 114 chests of tea to Boston in 1773. Now, fully rigged vessels like the Dartmouth would not typically engage in the act of whaling. Rather, they would serve as cargo transport vessels, often transporting huge amounts of whale oil to ports. The Dartmouth itself would often transport barrels of whale oil from Nantucket to London, England. She was approximately 80 feet on deck and about 116 feet in overall length. She had a keel of 63 feet long and a beam of 23 feet 6 inches. Her rigging towered approximately 75 feet above the waterline, and when fully loaded, she weighed approximately 250 burthen tons. Of course, the New Bedford Whaling Museum has a beautiful scale model of the Dartmouth on display, and you're seeing on your screen now some uh, close-up footage on that. The model was built by Richard Glanville and is, to my knowledge, the only true representation of the vessel anywhere to be found, and it is a beautiful treasure of this museum. 
Now, one unique feature of the Dartmouth was her nine-foot draft. Of course, a ship's draft is the distance between the waterline and the keel. And often, a vessel's dimensions would be constructed with their home ports in mind, creating unique dimensions during their construction. The Dartmouth's home port was the island of Nantucket. Nantucket was actually the home port of two vessels, the Dartmouth and the Beaver, both involved in the Boston Tea Party. Nantucket Island has a large sandbar at its mouth. Any vessels going in and out of that harbor had to be able to sail comfortably and safely over that sandbar. And so the Dartmouth's draft was set at nine feet, meaning no other vessels could have a draft greater than nine feet to make it over that bar. As I said, the Dartmouth was captained by James Hall, and she was, of course, owned by Francis Roach, a member of the famous Roach family, intimately tied to New Bedford's history, as well as the history of Nantucket. Francis Roach was the third son of Joseph Roach, the patriarch of the family. Joseph had a reputation for being a fair and honest businessman, and the Roach family owned a fleet of 15 vessels and controlled and handled every aspect of their whaling industry. They hired captains and crews, scheduled voyages, did their own accounting, assessed monetary exchange rates, graded their whale oil, and determined when the most profitable times were to ship this oil and bone to the markets. Now, interestingly enough, there were other cargoes on board the Dartmouth, aside, the, aside from the tea. On board the Dartmouth was another treasure, a book of poetry written by a now very famous poet, uh, Phyllis Wheatley, the first woman of African descent, enslaved person, and third woman in America to publish a book of poetry. Phyllis Wheatley was kidnapped as a child of seven or eight years of age in West Africa. She survived the brutal middle passage aboard the slave ship Phyllis and was purchased by the Wheatley family in Boston. There she was stripped of her African identity and renamed after the vessel that transported her to Boston Town. It was shortly after her arrival that Susanna Wheatley realized that Phyllis had an amazing capacity to read and write. She would then, of course, go on to write a book of poetry, poems on various subjects, religious and moral. This book would be published in London and brought to Boston on board the Dartmouth. And that book was in the hold alongside the East India Company tea. Ultimately, her books would be safe from any sort of damage. Of course, the Sons of Liberty took great care to only destroy the tea that night, and all other cargoes were removed from the Dartmouth well before the evening of December 16th. And her books were sold at Cox and Berry booksellers just up the road from Griffin's Wharf. Now, Francis Roach would find himself in a very unenviable position in the lead-up to the destruction of the tea. He was, of course, stuck in the middle of tense negotiations between the tea consignees, the town selectmen, and the Sons of Liberty, who were all doing everything they possibly could to prevent the unloading of this tea and hoping to send this tea back to England. Roach was summoned multiple times before the meetings of the body of the people and made to beg passage from Royal Governor Thomas Hutchinson to allow the Dartmouth to set sail for London with that cargo of tea still on board. But of course, each time Francis Roach went before the governor, his request was refused. On the evening of December 16th, it was Francis Roach himself that delivered the news to a packed Old South meeting house. It is said that 5,000 inhabitants were crammed into every nook and cranny of Old South Meeting House. And it was Roach that delivered the news that that tea would not be unloaded, or that that tea had to be unloaded as the law demands, excuse me. And of course, when that news was given, a cacophony of sound echoed throughout Old South Meeting House and across the entire city. Merchant John Andrews, who was not inside Old South Meeting House at the time, but several blocks away, would write in his diary that night that when Francis Roach gave the news that the governor would demand the tea be unloaded, you'd have thought the inhabitants of the infernal regions had broken loose. There was that much emotion and that much passion in Boston that night. Now, it is interesting to note that when the Dartmouth arrives on November 28, 1773, the arrival of that vessel literally sets in motion the ticking clock to the tea's destruction. You see, in 1651, the British Parliament, in the first of what came to be known as the Navigation Acts, declared that only English ships would be allowed to bring goods into England, and that the North American colonies could only export as commodities, such as tobacco and sugar, to England. 
And this effectively prevented the colonies from trading with any other European countries at the time. But additionally, and most importantly, it also set a clock, a time for when the vessel was sighted in the outer harbor until the cargo had to be unloaded. And there was a 20-day deadline from November 28th to December 17th, 1773. The moment the Dartmouth arrived in Boston Harbor, the fate of the tea was sealed. And the Sons of Liberty knew they had at least 20 days to determine what the fate of that, what they referred to of the pernicious weed would be. And so the timeline of the Dartmouth literally becomes the timeline of the Boston Tea Party. Now going back to that cacophony of sound that John Andrews heard, from this point, the fate of the tea is no longer in the hands of the body of the people. Rather, it was now determined by a group of resolute men, some of whom were loosely disguised. Some came from the meeting house, just straight from the town meeting, while others came from different corners of town, suggesting that there was a prearranged plan in place. When Samuel Adams stood up and said this meeting can do nothing more to save the country, that is believed to have been a secret signal, and the Sons of Liberty sprang into this prearranged plan and made their way down to Griffin's Wharf. Once at the wharf, they divided into three different boarding parties, about 50 men per vessel, and they quickly and quietly went about their business aboard deck, hauling the chests of tea out of the holds, bringing them to the rails, breaking them open with axes before shaking the loose-leaf tea into Boston Harbor and throwing the chests themselves behind into the harbor for good measure. Robert Sessions, a Boston Tea Party participant, would describe the scene thusly. He would say the chests were drawn up by tackle, one man bringing them forward, another putting a rope around them, and others hoisting them to the deck and carrying them to the vessel's side. The chests were then opened, the tea emptied over the side, and the contents and the chests themselves thrown overboard. Although there were many people along the wharf, entire silence prevailed on the wharf. No clamor. No talking. Nothing was meddled with but the teas on board. After having emptied the hole, the deck was swept clean and everything put in its proper place. An officer was even brought on board and requested to come up from the cabin and see that no damage was done except to the tea. We were merry in an undertone. All told, 92,616 pounds of East India Company tea was destroyed from three vessels. This totaled a monetary value of approximately 10,000 pounds sterling, or between 1.5 and 1.8 million dollars in today's modern currency. And well, of course, we also have this discrepancy between the number of chests uh, destroyed. Why has there always been this belief that 342 chests of tea were destroyed from the three vessels? Well, we have on the screen now the actual copies of the East India Manifest. And we can do the basic arithmetic, friends. Now, math was absolutely my worst subject. Thank you, Dad, uh, for all of your help. Uh, but uh, even I can do the basic math here. So we can look here together. So 114 chests of tea aboard the Dartmouth, 114 chests of tea aboard the Eleanor, but 112 chests of tea aboard the Brig Beaver, 340 chests of tea. Now, if you are a teacher, or if you've told other people that 342 chests of tea were involved in the Boston Tea Party, fret not. It's quite all right. Even Samuel Adams got the number wrong uh, when he wrote something the very next day. No offense, Mr. Adams, nobody's perfect. Uh, even he assumed it was 342. So that is the uh, rapid fire telling of the lead up to the Boston Tea Party. And that is, of course, a bit more of a complicated uh, overview of what has oftentimes been seen as a rather simple event, right? A bunch of drunken people put on costumes and storm the vessels, make a great noise, destroy everything in sight. Well, that's not what happened. It was, of course, complicated and convoluted like everything. And the tax on tea, of course, did not make the tea more expensive, it made it cheaper. The event itself was less about taxation and more about representation in Parliament. So what then is this legacy of the Boston Tea Party? If everything we've learned about it isn't true, then why are we celebrating it? Why are we commemorating it? Why are we here tonight? Because there are basic themes, basic concepts, 
that are important with the Boston Tea Party story that are, of course, still very much applicable to our lives today. Things like representation in our own government and what that even means, the idea of the American right to protest, the idea of civil disobedience and civic engagement. These things were critically important in 1773, and of course, if you've been watching the news, you know how important they are in 2023. These are those themes that we teach our guests that come to the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. These are the themes that we need to be teaching students around the world about this important chapter of American history. These are all things that we can still relate to. As a matter of fact, John Adams, because of these themes, would call the Boston Tea Party the most magnificent movement of all. And even royal governor Thomas Hutchinson, sensing its great importance, would call it the boldest stroke yet struck in America. Its principles and values still speak through the generations, and ideas of protesting against injustice and tyranny are things that we can all still relate to even 250 years later. The other thing that we can relate to today, in a modern sense, is the list of names of the Boston Tea Party participants. When you think about them, it is easy for us to look at this list of names and think of them as some you know, long dead person who's unrelatable to our lives. Yes, they are long since dead, but they are not unrelatable to what we are going through because they have been part of the human condition, just as we are today. And when you think back about history, be it Roman times, the American Revolution, or the far off history before all of us, there are some basic principles that are inherent to our human condition. Everyone on this list was looking to do what you are all looking to do with your lives, to make ends meet, to protect their families, and build a better future for their community. These basic goals are our goals, no matter what century we're talking about. The Boston Tea Party participants were no different. They were not the famous people, no offense, Mr. Adams, again, uh, that we have known over the years. John Hancock, John Adams, even Samuel Adams was not on board the vessel on December 16, 1773. But who was? The common, yet critically important people of the American colonies. Coopers, cobblers, shoemakers, house rights, ships, shipwrights, house painters, wallpaperers. These supposedly ordinary citizens did an extraordinary thing, and they are more than worthy of our recognition and commemoration. And the vast majority of the Boston Tea Party participants were even young adults and apprentices. These were ordinary people, sure, but they did indeed do an extraordinary thing. And so when you look at this list of names, you have to think about the humanity inherent in them. And what do you get in history? You get passion, you get love, loss, complexity, victory, de defeat, heroic people, flawed people, complicated people. It was a complicated time. These were complicated people as we are complicated here today. And in the 250th anniversary year, it is our mission to tell this nuanced story, this complicated story about these complicated people. And so, as we work our way to December 16th, 2023, we have a whole commemorative year planned. And we're going to make this anniversary something to remember for another 50 years until the 300th anniversary. We're gonna be doing this by creating some inherent programmatic goals for the rest of the commemorative year, bringing an international awareness to the Boston Tea Party's pivotal role in the lead up to the American Revolution. We're gonna create dynamic, inclusive, and collaborative programming to encourage public education, conversation, and engagement. We're gonna be engaging with school systems, both locally and nationally, and encourage, of course, visitation to our Commonwealth and all the various museums uh, that have a connection to the Boston Tea Party story. And if you'll permit me quickly, I'll go through some of our other signature programs that I will you know, invite you uh, to be a part of this year. Our main partner, in addition to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, is uh, Revolution 250, a consortium of over 70 different organizations all working together for all of these upcoming 250th anniversaries and commemorations. As I told you a few minutes ago, we have been traveling across America, placing markers at the headstones of known Boston Tea Party participants. They are buried as far north as the border of Maine and Canada, as far south as Alexandria, Virginia, as far west as Cincinnati, Ohio, and as far away as Paris, France. 
Uh, we just got back from Cincinnati, Chillicothe, Ohio, just a few days ago, um, and we're treated to some wonderful hospitality in their community. And so it's fascinating to remember that the Boston Tea Party story does not belong only to Boston. These participants traveled all over the world and brought the story with them. You can see a few images from some recent uh, grave marker ceremonies here. Um, we also were treated to an entire week's travel across the entire state of Maine, um, and there we were able to meet with almost 100 different descendants of Boston Tea Party participants, which was uh, a great honor for us. You can see all the various states uh, that we'll be traveling to or have already traveled to, uh, placing these grave markers. And we will be traveling over to the UK and also to Paris, France uh, later on this year in September. I mentioned our educational outreach. Uh, we are right now reaching out to the greater community to encourage students to write essays, create artwork, uh, special videos all along the central themes of the Boston Tea Party. And we'll be displaying these um, exhibits and uh, various different types of artwork on a special website, bostonteaparty250.org. And we'll be reaching out to the schools this fall with the new school year. We are also encouraging students and all of you to send us loose leaf tea. If you mail your tea to the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum, we will put that tea into the tea chest uh, that will be part of the grand scale reenactment that night, and you will receive a certificate uh, proving that your tea was involved in the 250th anniversary reenactment of the Boston Tea Party. So spread the word there. Uh, we did this initiative several years ago and got some great letters. Uh, one kid even addressed it to His Majesty King George III. Way to go, kiddo. Really brave of you. I'm sure the king appreciated that. Now, one of the other uh, programs that we're working on very near and dear to our heart is a special exhibit about Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, we could do an entire hour-long talk on Phyllis Wheatley and her life and her importance to the American legacy that we obviously don't have time for tonight. However, we are commissioning a special exhibit involving six images about Phyllis Wheatley's life and a reconceptualization of what her life might have looked like had she not uh, been taken from Africa and enslaved here in America. Uh, that exhibit uh, will be displayed in downtown Boston in the fall in September. And again, you can look at bostonteaparty250.org for more details as uh, those are ironed out. One of the other great initiatives of ours is the Boston Tea Party Descendancy Program, linking participants and their descendants, the descendants of the Boston Tea Party participants, on a global scale. This is in partnership with American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And our program is designed to foster interest in genealogical connections to the participants of the Boston Tea Party, their families, and of course those involved in the making of colonial rebellion in America. Through access to historical documents, aid from professional genealogists, the NEHGS and the BTPSM are creating special lesson plans, resources, and most importantly, an online portal where even if you are not a descendant of the Boston Tea Party participants, you can join and gain access to historical information, research, letters, and this resource will continue to grow as participants allow us to share their own primary resource and their family genealogy over the years. Now, of course, all of this is leading up to and will culminate in the grand scale reenactment of the Boston Tea Party on December 16th later this year. We are only 211 days away, and yes, I do keep track. I know exactly how many days, hours, and seconds until the big night. Um, this is going to be something uh, worth traveling to Boston for, and the first time this grand scale reenactment will occur since the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're honored that this anniversary year will be the return of this important event. It is an event that is told in four parts. Uh, because this anniversary year is going to be encouraging so many people to Boston, we are expanding the footprint of the event. And for the first time ever, recreating a series of meetings of the body of the people that began at Faneuil Hall before moving to the famous Old South Meeting House. This program will be titled A Protest in Principle, and will look not just at the meetings of the body of the people leading up to December 16th, but also a look back at both the bicentennial commemorations and centennial commemorations that took place inside Faneuil Hall. At the centennial commemorations, Frederick Douglass and Lucy Stone stood up and gave passionate speeches about the legacy of the Boston Tea Party even 100 years after. We'll be rekindling that same passion in that building and looking forward to working with the city of Boston to make that possible. 
Of course, our partners at Revolutionary Spaces will be doing a dynamic presentation called The Meetings of the Body of the People Inside Old South Meeting House, where the dramatic conclusion, Francis Roach will storm back into Old South Meeting House and deliver the news that the tea must be unloaded as the law demands. And inside there, hundreds of people will take part in an active town meeting. Once that town meeting is complete, Huzzah for Griffin's Wharf begins, and thousands of people will march from downtown Boston to the water's edge, where in days preceding, we have installed bleacher seating for all of you to have a safe and lovely viewing of the destruction of the tea. Boston Harbor will again be a teapot that night, and we have partnered with the East India Company out of London, and they will be sending us 250 pounds of tea in honor of the 250th anniversary, we will mix that with all of the tea that you will be sending me uh, at the museum, and we will again make Boston Harbor that teapot. It will be a remarkable evening and something that our Commonwealth and our area can be proud of. And we are expecting approximately 10,000 people to be in Boston that night to witness the destruction of the tea. We are looking at this commemorative year as a partnership between, of course, historical organizations, the historical community, the hospitality community of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the travel and tourism community. Hotels all around the Commonwealth are about to unveil hotel packages, encouraging you to come to Boston and the Boston area to be downtown that night on December 16th. And there will, of course, be a dedicated website, bostonteaparty250.org, where you can find all the information about the events forthcoming and about the big evening on December 16th. But I think to summarize the commemorative year, uh, this video will do nicely, and then we'll get into our dramatic recreation of the evening's events. Boston, a city upon a hill, a city of history and innovation, a city of culture, art, and tradition, a city of champions, legends, and revolutionaries, a diverse city of courage, compassion, and strength. Around every corner, there are echoes of the past, from the cobblestone streets to the historic buildings, standing the test of time, reminding us of where we've been and where we still need to go. History happens here. This history is complicated and complex. Telling the stories of our past informs our present and guides us all to a better future. In 1773, scores of colonists boarded three ships and risked everything to defy a tyrannical government. A moment that went far beyond tea and taxation. A moment defined by one's right to protest, representation in one's own government, being treated fairly, and about ordinary citizens doing extraordinary things. The Boston Tea Party. A moment that sent America down the road to revolution. In 2023, Boston will commemorate the 250th anniversary of this iconic moment that forever changed the course of American history through a year of public engagement, dynamic programming, exhibits, special events, installations, and performances where audiences can explore the many layers of Boston's Tea Party story. The Year of Commemorations will feature unprecedented levels of collaboration between organizations across Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, including museums, schools, historical organizations, as well as Boston's arts, tourism, and hospitality industries. This commemorative year will culminate in the grand-scale reenactment of the Boston Tea Party on the 250th anniversary, December 16th, 2023. This world-class public event will take place at the very locations where the Boston Tea Party occurred two and a half centuries before. History happens here, and will happen here again. Be part of that history in 2023, and commemorate Boston's Tea Party legacy as an inspiration to generations of people around the world. Be history. 
be here. Be Boston. So, it's going to be a fascinating evening, a wonderful evening, and something that our state, our region, can be very proud of. And again, I think uh, for my portion of this evening's uh, presentation, as it concludes, I want to remind everyone, as I said earlier, the Boston Tea Party does not belong to Boston. It may have happened in Boston, but it changed the world. And those participants went around the world and brought those central themes to a greater community. And this is an amazing opportunity for us to celebrate New Bedford's rich maritime history and nautical history, its connection to the Boston Tea Party, and an opportunity for us to celebrate every town's history across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, because those people really did change the world. And we're looking forward to changing the world in 2023 and moving forward. Now, before I pass uh, the baton to our historical interpreters, does anyone have any questions uh, regarding any of the historical information leading up to the Boston Tea Party or about the commemorative year in general? Yes, please. Eighteen twenty-six. Simply the destruction of the tea, or the incident on Griffin's Wharf. If you could wait for the microphone so we can get your question on. Great. Notice that uh, Sarah Fulton's name wasn't listed. Sure. So Sarah Bradley Fulton's name is not technically on the list of participants, uh, mainly because she was not on board the vessels destroying the tea. However, Sarah Bradley Fulton, we have placed an honorary marker at her grave uh, for being an honorary participant as part of the lead up to the Tea Party. Sarah Bradley Fulton is often referred to as the mother of the Boston Tea Party because she was intimately tied to the planning of the event and she is often credited with gathering a lot of the disguises for the men who were on board the vessels that night. Um, and so she has a special plaque downtown. She also has a plaque in our office at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. And now she has a plaque on her headstone for that honorary participation in the event. Thank you. Huzzah. Huzzah indeed, sir. Any other questions? Have you invited King Charles? Well, funny you should mention that. Um, we have been talking uh, with the United Kingdom. However, as you might expect, they pretty much said, can you wait just a little bit until we get this big shindig uh, taken care of over there? Um, but we have been working with the United East India Company for the better part of two years. And we also have great connections with the Consul General's office here in Massachusetts. And so uh, we do intend on going to London uh, the week, I believe, is September 25th, and we are doing an event with the East India Company, and we do hope to have some sort of royal participation. I do not believe His Majesty himself will be in attendance, uh, but we will be extending an invitation for some sort of royal proclamation to be part of the commemorative year, as we have also begun our process of reaching out to our government here in this nation for some sort of involvement, too. Any other questions? That's it. That's easy. All right. Well, uh, if you'll permit me now, um, I will pass the stage on uh, to our historical interpreters of the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. We will go back 250 years to the evening of December 16th, 1773, and I present Miss Priscilla Scalé.
Huzzah. Let us all try it on my hip hip. Hip hip. Huzzah. Excellent. Now we are going to hear things today that we disagree with, and to that you should loudly boo. Or you can give it a very proper kiss. And if something greatly offends you, I wish you to use the rudest word we have here in Boston, which is fi, F-I-E. And this rude word comes with an equally offensive hand gesture. But as the proper young lady I am, of course I'm going to teach it to you. You're going to take your thumb, plant it firmly on your nose. You're going to raise the flag, wave the flag, look to who you wish most to offend, and cry out fi! Oh my word, I didn't think we'd get so angry so quickly, Boston. Well... On to the business have at hand. We have speaking with us today on the matter of tea and art and patriot, a leader amongst the sons of liberty and a friend to us all, Mr. Samuel Adams. Hip hip, huzzah! Thank you for that spirited introduction, Miss Calais, and good day to you all. Good day, sir. Indeed, friends, but I do wish we were here on better circumstances. You see, we are gathered here today to discuss yet another crisis enforced upon us by Parliament, supposedly on behalf of our monarch, King George the Third. Out in that Boston Harbor are the three ships, the Eleanor, the Dartmouth, and the Brig Beaver. And their holds are bursting with 340 crates of East India Company tea. Pernicious stuff indeed, and under the law, each of these vessels has 20 days to unload its cargo and pay the duties or taxes upon the tea. And tomorrow marks the 20th day for the ship Dartmouth, making this body of the people all the more important, as this marks our final chance to affect these events in our favor! Here, here, here! Now, earlier this day, it was requested that the ship's owner, Francis Roach, that he obtain word from our, well, let's just call him our esteemed royal governor, Thomas Hutchinson. Bye. Thomas Hutchinson, fie! Yes, a man who abandoned the cause of the people years ago, yet he, curiously, well, he is the only man that can grant these vessels a pass to allow them to return to England without unloading their pernicious cargo. Mm. And Mr. Roach did leave several hours ago. Right. We anxiously await his return and cling to the hope that the governor will listen to reason, for if that cargo is unloaded, then it is you, the good citizens of Boston, who will be forced to pay this unjust tax on tea! Oh! Now, friends, it is important to note that, well, this is not the first time Parliament has taxed us like this and without our consent, as it was only eight short years ago in 1765 when Lord Grenville saw fit to tax our letters, our newspapers, and indeed all of our printed materials under the Stamp Act. Yes, indeed, and on the issues of those Stamp Acts, many were outraged, many set to the streets rioting and such. It was the 60s, my friends, but others took to town meetings such as these to voice their opinions, such as our dear friend Mr. Thomas Porter. Mr. Porter, where are you? Raise your hand so we know who you are. There you are, Mr. Porter. Now, you have always been outspoken on the issues of taxation. What say you on those Stamp Acts, sir? even taxed her playing cards and dice. Oh, boo! Outrageous oh. indeed! Thank you, Mr. Porter, thank you. And uh, I know you're not just mad about that because of your gambling habit, indeed. of course. Yes, indeed, it was a tax on fun. And we were told that these taxes were meant to repay our debts from the French and Indian War, but I hold that we have repaid these debts a thousand times over. After all, it was our fathers, mm. our brothers, and our sons who fought alongside the king's army oh. in that war. And I say, if there was ever a price to be paid, we all did so at the expense of blood and on that good New England well, blood, said, patriots. Mr. But Adams. This, well, this is a price we have paid far too often, isn't it, Boston? Mm. Lest we forget those five innocent Bostonians who were gunned down on King Street in March of 1770 massacred by the very British regulars who were sent to protect our street. <laughs> a fine job they did at that, but well, thanks to the work of my cousin John Adams, we did give those men a fair trial. And I am proud to say that the entire 29th Regiment was soon recalled thereafter, hmm. but Boston, the recall of one regiment alone is not enough. No, I say nothing short of an entire evacuation. By all those bloody back troops will be enough to satisfy the public mind and preserve the peace. Well said, sir. Well That's said. right, friends, but our cries, as loud and as valiant as they may be, are not being heard by those in Parliament. After the Stamp Acts were repealed, those in Parliament next saw fit to pinch our pewter candlesticks, our lead, our glass, our paint, and yes, our tea, all taxed under a man who we thought was our friend in Parliament. Sure. How wrong we were to trust in Lord Charles Townsend Bye. by the traitor Townsend Fie. Now, Mr. Porter, your anger has been echoed by many others as well, including a Mr. James Brewer. Now, Mr. Brewer, I heard that your house needed new windows, but with this tax on glass, how did you manage to pay for them? I did not pay for them. Yes, indeed. No. I was forced to choose between food for my family's belly 
or the window. Oh, oh. boo! Outrageous Shameful. indeed! Yes, thank you, Mr. Brewer. What a terrible choice to have to make. And in response to outrages such as these, will our patriot merchants band it together? We signed non-importation agreements stating that we would no longer buy or sell any of these unjustly taxed goods. Oh. And the women of Boston, the Daughters of Liberty, joined together as well, signing non-consumption agreements, stating that these goods would never enter their homes. Yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, friends. Yeah. It is by your united efforts, through your united resolves, you, the people of Boston, have forced many of these towns and duties to be repealed. Uh -huh. But, but, there appears to be an ever-growing hole in the purse of the English treasury, and now their greedy eyes have turned to our tea. And if Lord North wishes to force a three penny per pound tax upon tea to simply signify the supremacy of Parliament and its supposed right to tax us here in the colonies, well then I say we have a right to demand representation well there. Said, yes, sir, well said. The Magna Carta of 1215, our Charter of 1691 patriots, these are the very founts of our British liberties, and they make it quite clear that no British subject can be taxed without consent of their representative. And if they expect us to pay taxes like an English to go to war and to fight like an Englishman, then we deserve the same basic rights as Englishmen! And if they strip us of our basic rights to representation, then they have no rights to force more duties upon us, which means we, Boston, have no more duties to pay. We must all cling to the spirited words of James Otis, the ones that echoed from the State House Square and rang through these beloved colonies like a trumpet from heaven. Taxation without representation is tyranny. And the time for petition, the time for compromise is over! Huzzah! Now my friend, oh, yes indeed. Word from our governor is in. Thank you very much, Miss Clay. Friends, this is the news we've been waiting for. It says that the, the governor is willing to grant anything consistent with the laws and his duty to the king, but, but, but orders that the vessels cannot leave unless the cargo is unloaded as the law demands. And Boston, what say you all to this? Oh! There you have it. Our governor has refused to send this tea back to England. He has refused every petition, every course and recourse to an amicable solution, and he has forced our hand. Right. Now as the sun rises, customs officials will board those ships, unload the tea, and give it to those hand-picked loyalist tea merchants, the consignees. S and we, the people of Boston, will be forced to pay this unjust tax, and any merchant who refuses to sell this foul brew will be strangled by an East India Company monopoly. No, the time has come for you, the people of Boston, to decide what to do. And that is why I turn to you, Miss Scalay. Oh, me? Y yes, indeed. You have done an excellent job at leading this meeting so far, and I do think it's time for your voice to be heard as well. So what do you think we should do tonight? Well, I do have one idea, my friends. It's very clear. Salt, water, and tea should all mix tonight. But what say you, Boston? Should we go destroy some tea? Here, here! <laughs> Oh, what a mighty mob we have in our hands. But let me warn you, friends, if you destroy this tea tonight, you may be subject to arrest. Oh. Yes, our families, those that harbor us, they will be subject to the fullest penalties of the law, and therefore we should do our very best to conceal our identities this night. And how do you reckon we do that, sir? Cloaks and blankets shall suffice, oh. but along with that, let us use a symbol known to all those in the North American colonies. Our unique symbol, fearsome and independent, the symbol of the Mohawk. Now carry these with you with pride, and rally to Griffin's Wharf, patriots! Huzzah! Huzzah! Boston Harbor, a teapot tonight. It is clear there is nothing more a meeting can do to save this country. That is our cue, my friends. Rise up, gather all your belongings. We must storm down to Griffin's Wharf. Follow us right this way. Hip, hip, huzzah! Excellent, my friends, right this way. We made our way down to Griffin's Wharf. We made our first act of trespassing. Huzzah! and your bravery is much needed, but I should ask you a few questions, making sure we're all here for the right reason. If you are here to destroy the king's tea, say aye! Aye! If you are here to cast off the oath of parliamentary tyranny, say aye! Aye! If you are here to be caught and arrested for treason, say aye! aye. No, 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 I'm sorry, that was a trick question, and some of us have failed. So let's show, make sure we're aware of our dangers. Should the first thing in all your minds are those three British warships out in the harbor, they're Captain the Wait, active and the King Fisher. And they all combined have over 100 cannons. Should they fire off those cannons, they can sink the three ships we are on here today. However, I believe we should be all right, as they have orders to fire on any vessel 
trying to leave the harbor with the tea still on board. From what I understand, our plan is not to take the tea out of Boston Harbor. We're putting it right back into Boston Harbor. So that takes care of me. Don't need to worry the army either. They're all the way out to Ca uh, Castle William, and they are not allowed back into Boston Harbor without direct word from our governor. And well, the coward he is, he's fled to Milton tonight, eight mile journey away, so it'd be impossible to get his word from Milton back into Boston to break off our protest. So that leaves just one danger left. That is all of you. See, you've come down here as friends, family members. We know each other from church and town meeting, but what we're doing tonight is treason. And do any of you know the punishment for treason? Death. Death? Yes. By hanging? Yes, it's not a fate I wish for any of us here today. So I say we enter into an oath of secrecy to make sure we never speak of the names or the actions we've seen this night. I'll ask everyone to raise your right hand. You're going to repeat after myself. You'll say, I swear. I swear. I was not there. I was not there. I think that works. You all look very Excellent, my friends. Well, I see we do have two tea chests here ready to be speaking to Boston Harbor. So I say we shall make a cup of tea for the fishes, yes? Yes. yes. Excellent. Count with us, friends. One, two, three. Huzzah! That's our first two down. Only 112 chests left to go on the Dartmouth and the Eleanor, and only 111 left, or 110, pardon me, on the Brig Beaver. Now, I believe Mr. Adams is coming right round to tell you a bit more about some of our tea this night. Indeed, my friends. Congratulations. You did just destroy two chests of tea, but friends, let's take a closer look at what is inside these tea chests. Here we have one of the medium-sized chests of tea, which can weigh upwards to about 100 pounds. Now, don't worry, this is not the largest of these tea chests, which can weigh upwards to 400 pounds. And as you can see, it is lined with canvas and stamped with the initials of the United East India Company. That U-E-I-C on that logo right there. Yes, that, uh, V-looking symbol is a Latin style you. They like to be fancy in England, indeed. Now, this is the merchant's mark of the United East India Company, telling us exactly where the product is coming from. Now, my friends, in order to get into the car, uh, to the tea, we will have to rip open the canvas, hack through the crate, and then hack through the lead foil lining that poses no risk whatsoever to our health and safety. Now, indeed, my friends, in order to do this, we will need our hatchet. So, patriots. Here we are. There we go, friends. And now we can get in and see the loose leaf tea that is inside these tea chests. All of the tea is coming to the colonies from China, and there are five different teas aboard the vessels this night. Sushong, Kanju, and Buhi are the three black teas, and Singlo and Heisen are the two green teas, all together weighing about 92,616 pounds in weight and cost about 10,000 pounds sterling of the king's money, or in your modern currency, about $1.5 million. Huzzah! Yeah. Indeed, under this tea act, only seven known merchants were allowed to sell the East India Company tea in North America. And we do recall hearing about these consignees. Yes, they were the seven loyalists that were uh, handpicked to sell the East India Company tea. And many patriots noted that well, all seven were known loyalists, two of which were Governor Hutchinson's own sons. Well, the Parliament is going to pick the work of chosen merchants while denying others the right to be part of the tea trade. Well, many people would just rather boycott the tea altogether. Or in our case, my friends, destroy the tea! Huzzah! Yeah! Now, indeed, my friends, the Sons of Liberty divided themselves into boarding parties of 35 to 55 men aboard each vessel to destroy the cargo. And there is a variety of cargo aboard these vessels, so they must be careful. Indeed, this cargo can be uh, transporting trunks, crates, and casks that will uh, be sealed with linseed oil, pitch, or pine tar to store wet goods. And indeed, these types of goods include Madeira wine, lumber, timber, uh, even fine furniture. But my friends, we are here for one thing and one thing alone, and that is the... Tea! Excellent, my friends. Now, as we said before, these tea chests can be very heavy, about 400 pounds. And in order to get these chests above deck, we're not going to just use our bare hands. No, we're going to use a bit of engineering or a block and tackle system to hoist these chests above deck. Once they are men with hatchets, we'll take the chest over to the bulwarks or the side of the ship like so. The city hands, you know, the lawyers, the doctors and such. They will hack open the crate with the hatchet and do so, uh, as we've done before and then scrape out the loose leaf tea that is so densely packed that they have to use their fingernails, their shoes, their hatchets, anything else they can think of to be able to get these teas out into the harbor. And then they will toss the empty crates over to the harbor with it. It does sound like a lot of hard work, but luckily tonight was very well organized and deep pages as it needed to be. We did destroy 340 chests of East India Company tea and I'm quite proud of all of you, my friends. Now, we should go our separate ways home this evening, but before we do, don't forget to remove any disguises, take any lamp black or soot off from your faces, and remove any feathers from your cap. As while we are celebrating our accomplishment over this night, there was also a sense of dread over the eventual consequences of our actions. For when King George finds about the, out about the tea destruction, he in Parliament will pass 
the coercive acts, or the intolerable acts as many will come to know them here in town. This will close off the port of Boston until we can pay back the money from the tea. And indeed, this creates quite a lot of problems here in Boston as we are a port town. Many of the surrounding colonies notice our plight, send in food and aid to those remaining still in town, and a Continental Congress is formed in Philadelphia to discuss how to end these intolerable acts. Trained men, uh, ordinary men, be begin training alongside trained groups of Minutemen to form these militias, and eventually, on April 19th, 1775, the shot heard round the world will officially begin the American Revolution. But my friends, I believe the spark that ignited these tensions was here on the ship where we destroyed the tea. Huzzah! Yeah. Indeed, my friends, that does conclude our presentation, but myself and Miss Galay will be here for any questions that you have about the history, the site, the tea, anything that we've discussed. So my friends, once again, we will open the floor to any questions that you have about our presentation or anything else you'd like to know. Patriots, we will be around, so please ask us anything. We have heard it all. Thank you. Thank you.